Welcome guys, analysis of a fix and flip. I'm gonna kind of take you behind the scenes on a practical deal that we actually did, a case study, but also go through this as a, a learning experience. I'm gonna be sharing a lot of what I've learned over the last 18 years of, of buying, renovating and, and reselling houses, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, the fun stuff. So flipping a house from beginning to end isn't an easy task if you've never done it, or if you've done a couple, I'm sure you've experienced what it's like to get into these deals. So I'm going to be taking you guys through three phases. So buying the property, evaluating how I evaluate my quick process of evaluating properties to identify that would be a good fix and flip. Um, how do I write the offer, making the offer, and then how we close, how we're closing them and your financing ability or, or access to capital, the speed to capital is so critical in this game right here. So fixing the property, creating the scope of work, the things that you need to know prior before you even get a contractor coming over to the house. Um, and then the process of hiring those contractors and managing the timeline. And, and um, one other thing, guys, this is recorded. So don't beat yourself up on, you know, writing everything down. Like I said, this is 18 years of information that I've uh, been through hundreds of, of deals with. So if you have any questions, hit the uh, raise your hand and Jaime will stop me. So and then what I like to say preparing the property or positioning the property for market, right? It's a different um, mindset when you're the owner of a house, completely different when you're a real estate agent that's going to ink a listing agreement to sell somebody's house, right? You may put money on the line for marketing, videos, photography, staging, all these other things. If you're doing real estate at a high level that you would invest in that listing, but typically when you're flipping properties, you don't have any, or if you're not flipping them, you don't have any idea of the financial side of just these deals, just getting away from you, right? If it's different when you're a homeowner living in a house versus you're an investor owning a house. So we're going to talk about some of the, um, the really things to look out for, because you really want to push these deals to the finish line as quickly as possible. Um, a little bit about myself, past career as a hairdresser. It's people always kind of get a chuckle out of that, but I had a very successful real estate, I mean, uh, hairdressing career before I made the transition into real estate. Um, I got a hairdressing license in 2001. Had an aha moment over the years of people that were my clients that were very successful. I started to know something different about their lives. They lived a different lifestyle. They, were, they had time freedom. They had location freedom. And pretty much all of those folks were in real estate. So that was my kind of aha journey that I needed to be in real estate because we're either going to rent or we're going to own. So you're going to either pay someone else or they're going to pay you, but it's just a part of life. And I knew that as I got older, I wanted to be involved in real estate. So I'm about 18 years. I'm in my second decade of real estate now. So it's been pretty fun. Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if you haven't read that book, you have to read it. It has to be a, a staple in anybody in real estate. Um, I really started studying real estate in the early 2000s. And back then the market was hot. It was still rising. So people were making a pile of money in real estate all the way up into 06, 07. And then at the end of 08, 911, housing market went upside down. But, um, and then we had a good run from there. So like right now there was a shift in the market. The opportunity is on the investing side. People are still gonna buy and sell. But if you got caught in a situation where your retail business, buyers and sellers looking to sell on the open market, if that completely dried up, you have to have a niche in place that can continue to carry you through these ups and downs. And, and investing has been that niche for me. I personally bought and sold hundreds of homes. I got licensed in 2015, and hopped into the brokerage side because I understood volume. And that's what we did when we owned an investment company. We bought properties at, in volume, cleaned them up, renovated them, sold them, and then started carrying back notes. So today on the investing side, I'm more of a, a consultant. I, I'm still an investor. I've moved on to, um, I wouldn't say moved on. I'm still involved in single family houses, but a bulk of my capital is in multifamily new construction, bigger deals, bigger returns. All right. So how do we find deals to flip? How do we find them to buy, renovate, and resell? And I can tell you my most profitable deals over the years have always been from referrals. So how you brand yourself in your local market, like we were talking a moment ago, Chris, about new construction, right? If you're in a new construction market, everything that you do live and breathe should be new, new construction. Everyone in your SOI and in your Facebook groups and just everyone that sees you on a daily, weekly basis should know what you do. So dialing in your audience of kind of what you do. So it's different when you're an agent selling houses versus an investor looking for off-market opportunities, you know, distressed houses. 
because finding distressed houses is a full-time job if you want to do it in volume. Now, the one-off stuff, it's a little bit easier. But number one is just referrals. Who knows you? What do you do? Is investing a part of what you do? I've continued to receive referral leads over the years from people that were behind on payments, facing foreclosure, bankruptcies, divorces, like really distressed situations. And I've been able to use both hats, the investor hat and the agent hat. And it's been very successful for myself over the years. So your social media content, you have to think of that as a marketing strategy, right? Most agents don't think of their social media as a strategy. It's just, oh, I'm going to post about this. I'm going to post about this. You got to be very intentional, <clears throat> excuse me, about your social media strategy. What are you putting out there in the world right now? So YouTube is huge because people are searching on YouTube. People are searching on Google. So we buy houses fast, distressed sellers, how to sell your house without a real estate agent, all these different keywords that people that own property, if you want to build a funnel around that, YouTube channel, videos, all your marketing, or even getting really specific with it, like probates or divorces or any type of distress situation, you can market that. And people are searching for solutions on YouTube and Google. So they're going to Google and they're typing in, have, have a house need to sell, need to sell a house, how to sell a house out of state. Like all these keywords that people are typing in, you can be creating content to capture and get in front of those folks. You may not be able to buy and take the deals down yourself, but you could always position yourself as a listing agent to sell it. Wholesalers are a great resource. Um, I've networked with wholesalers over the years. I have a huge database of other investors in my market. I try to connect with them as much as possible because that they're the ones that are making it happen. Um, the MLS is another abundant resource depending on your target. If you have a buyer client looking to buy houses at 50 cents on the dollar, the MLS probably isn't the, the right spot. Now, what we've done with the MLS over the years is we've been able to find properties on the MLS that we could that we could buy and do a, an amazing renovation on. We're talking $150,000, $200,000 renovations on, and we can get that property to appraise because there's been other new construction, rebuilds, you know, houses getting torn in half and getting built. Any of those types of assets around the area, we can force appreciate that property. So it's kind of the, the sweet spot that we've gotten into over the last several years, which is buy anywhere from four to 500 or 350 to 500, and then turn around and sell it for seven to 800. That's not going to be available in everybody's market. And the case study that I have today is a lot less than that. That's just what we've evolved into over, over several years of doing this at a high level. County records are an amazing resource right now today. People that are losing their house to foreclosure, all that's county public record. You just have to figure out how to get the data or you're going to pay someone or pay a company or a service to extract the data for you. So instead of randomly knocking on doors as a lot of old school ways of old school tactics, I like to say some of the old school stuff still really works, but with the new twist to it. So if you pulled a list of people that were behind on payments that were facing foreclosure and you had a list of you know 100 homes in a certain zip code, Either yourself or a team of agents could go door knock those homes and provide them with some solutions. So being very intentional about the prospects and the, the sellers that you're reaching out to, the county records can tee that up for you. So another big one is code violations and then also water shutoff accounts. So think about that. Homeowners that have, that have had their water shut off by the county are typically abandoned houses. They haven't made the payments. Tax liens is another one bankruptcies, divorces, probates. These are all different lists that you can extract out of the county records yourself, or you pay a service to do it for you. And then messaging, door knocking, calling, direct mail to absentee owners, people that own properties out of state, probates, free and clear lists. So there's a lot of different ways that you can extract that data and market to that data. That's going to be your biggest return on investment and your highest, I guess, equity as well. So you can also find the opportunities that other agents and other brokers bring to you, different investors and stuff like that. But if you really want to get down to it, <clears throat> scrubbing through the public records and then targeting those homeowners directly gives you an opportunity to buy properties at a big discount and also be able to list more properties and sell them on the open market. So here's a quick evaluation that I run through. I take the address, I throw it in a Google map, and I just want to look at everything around it. Where is it? The highways, is there something behind it? Railroad track, is it butting up next to a you know, a, a junkyard or something. I want to see what it looks like on Google map before I even do any further due diligence on it. Then I can go down into the street and look around and do a 360 look. Then I'm going to jump on the tax site, look who's on title, see who owns it, see when they bought it, 
see if there was a mortgage recorded against it. Because I can do calculations based off of when they purchased, if they had a loan, historically what loan rates were in that time. So I can calculate and get a rough estimate of what I think they owe on the house. And it gives me an opportunity to, if someone's underwater on the house and I can't make them a cash offer, then we're going to have to go a short sale route. All right. Don't want to get into short sales right now. I've done short sales over the years. They might come back. Who knows? But right now, finding distressed homeowners and helping people sell, you know, assets that will never, ever go away. Um, and then looking at the MLS comps, what does the data tell me? What are houses selling for? I'm looking for an apple, apples to apples approach. I'm not trying to get fancy with it. I'm not trying to pull in comps from miles away. I'm looking at the, the immediate subdivision. Then I go out a little bit further, quarter mile. Then if I can't find any data there, then I'll go out just a little bit further. And I, and I really identify what I think we can sell this property for. So here's another, here's a huge one, estimating repairs. This is a really easy one. So we know after renovating houses for years that we're going to be somewhere between $35 a foot and $60 a foot. And when I say $60 a foot, I mean, that's going to be top down. We're going to replace the roof. We're going to repair, repaint, put gutters on it. We're going to blow insulation in like everything that we've done in houses. We know that we could pretty much do for 50 to 60 a foot. So when we're walking into the property, we already know based off of our past experience of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on renovations over the years, we know our numbers walking in. We don't get, we don't get inspections or anything like that. We know the pitfalls. We know all the different things that come up in deals that cost money. But for you guys walking into a house, 18 to $25 a foot would pretty much cosmetically do everything. So take an average you know, footprint in your market, 2,500 feet, whatever that number is, multiply it by $25 per foot. That'll give you a ballpark of what you could cosmetically update the house. Surfaces, paint, flooring, some hardware, some countertops, not restructuring, right? Not tearing walls down, putting LVL beams in, none of the restructuring stuff, just cosmetics. So no matter what house you're in, that will always give you a, a, a good ballpark for paint and flooring and some minor items. Um, and then you have to separate the big six. So what are the big six? Your foundation, your plumbing, your electrical, your HVAC, your roof. And then here's a big one, windows. That's always a big cost that comes into the deals. You know, should we, should, or should we not replace the windows? Well, if you're in a higher end area, right? I would say 400, 500, 600,000, and you're trying to capture top dollar, you may want to replace those original windows. So understanding the big six outside of your cosmetic budget. So you have your cosmetics, which is the interior. Then you have your big numbers. Those are pretty much separate. So you start adding up all these numbers, what you think it's going to cost to, to get the property to the top of the market for where you want to sell it. Offer formula, this will always be a, a ballpark, right? It's, this isn't the exact number, right? We crunch our numbers from the closing cost, all the fees, the taxes, the insurance, everything up front. And then we crunch our numbers for everything on the back end, what it's going to cost us to sell the property, the pass through on the taxes, the credits that we're going to give the, the buyer, the expenses, everything. And we all combine it in what we call an all in number. So me and my partners want to be all in at 80% or less. So we know that gives us a 20% return. But as just a general thumb, you can look at a property, very quickly identify what it needs, $20 a foot cosmetically. It needs a roof, HVAC, foundation. Okay, boom, boom, boom. I got my three expenses. I'm going to add all those together. I'm going to take it 75% 70, of after repaired value minus the cost of repairs get you to your offer price. So quick, quick numbers. If it's a $100,000 house, it's going to take $25,000 in repairs. So 75% of hundred grand is 75,000 minus 25, 50. That's my offer price. You can make them that fast. That gives you a ballpark. You always need to go verify the numbers. But when you're looking through deals and you're looking at opportunities, you can very quickly identify what a ballpark offer price would be. And that's the fastest way that you can get to that number. Here's the, the real case study. This is Lynn. This is a referral lead from a friend of mine who was an REO broker for years. She has a friend, Lynn, that lived in Florida. Her mother lived in Dallas. Her mother was ill. And the first time I went to this house, that window behind me there that's where her mother was living. And uh, the very first time I went there, her mother was ill. She was in a bed. They had, you know, nurses and all that stuff going on. A year and a half later, she actually called me back to, to buy the house. And I was in competition with Homevestors and a couple other, um, other folks. But we ended up winning the deal 
because we were solving challenges and solutions for her and her family. We were offering to pay for moving. We're offering to pay for a truck, a crew to come out and help her extract all the stuff out of the house. So those were some of the value adds and the things that we added value to her and her family of why we got the bid. There was a couple other bids a little higher than ours, but when you're really transparent with people, like I've, I've won bids coming from people coming back to me when I set an expectation of, Hey, if this and this happens, if they, if they try to string your contract out for a, a 10 day due diligence period, which we call an option period in Texas, and then they're going to try to come back and try to get you down on price. I've had people come back to me after they kind of terminated that deal. And we bought the house from them because we were very transparent with them up front and we were solving a lot of their challenges. So we closed on this deal with a, I call a joint venture private money partner at 82,000. And here, I'll give you a quick, uh, this could be an hour long or a three day weekend just on raising private capital. So the biggest thing that I've learned about people that have capital is they're looking for people they can trust and assets they can invest in. So you've heard this whole thing about, oh, uh, no money down investing and all that stuff. It's, it is true, but you've got to know what the hell you're doing, right? You can't sit down with people that have money, be like, oh yeah, we're looking to fill up a house. Like, all right, great. Well, what's your timeline? What's your ROI? How are you going to get me my money back? And if you're stumbling, it's like, they're not going to believe that they can trust you. So whenever you're looking to raise private capital, this is a investing strategy. It's called a deed of trust investing. First lien deed of trust that secures their investment. So some of the things that I structure is six to 12 month interest, interest only terms. I'm sure you guys have heard of hard money, 12%, four points, six month terms. Then they have penalties. They have additional, all these different, different ways that they're going to gouge you for more fees if the longer you hold on to their capital. So private capital is the fastest way to move in and out of deals because it's just your uncle Joe saying, yeah, let's do the deal. I trust you. Come on, let's go make some money together. Uncle Joe's investment is secured by a first lien deed of trust, just like a bank, right? How would you like to be a bank on a deal? Great. What do banks do? They loan money and they clip payments, put the money out They're in first lien, and then they get that cash flow. That's something that we flipped from renovating houses to selling them to renovating them and then selling them with a note. It's a whole nother model. I did that for nine years from 2009 or early, early 2000s, all the way up into 2016, where we created notes like a hedge fund. But for the point of this is when you're raising capital for a single house, there's a couple different ways that you can structure the deal. You don't want to combine people's money. You can do a first lien deed of trust. You can offer that participant investor an equity kicker. Hey, I'll give you 15% of the net profit at closing. You put that in writing, or we're going to do a joint venture split. That was something that I had negotiated with a lot of my partners that had capital. I went and found the deal. I brought it to them said, Hey, I'm going to run it and manage it and sell it. And I just want half of the profit. And they're like, great. So they put the money up. I do all the work. They sit back, they get an interest rate plus an equity kicker. So being transparent and building relationships is the name of the game with private capital. You can find private capital by going to investor club meetings. The fastest way to find a room full of people looking for type investment opportunities like this is a company called Equity Trust. So if you search self-directed Roth IRA, 401k, trust account or any type of equity. I say equity trust because that's the biggest custodian of private capital in the country. And then here in Texas, there's a company called Quest IRA. That's where Jaime and I met. That's a room full of investors looking for assets to put their money into in a self-directed Roth IRA tax-free vehicle. So those where you can find those investors looking for these types of deals. So here's the before pictures of this. When I look back on this case study, I realized I actually took a lot of photos of this particular house. But this was a bungalow built in 1945 or 46 or something like that. I don't remember, but it had never been touched. It was in an area that was turning Bishop Arts. And we knew that there was a lot of demand for this area. So the picture on the right is me standing at the front door, looking into the living area. And that's the kitchen over there with the window. But I want you guys to remember that bookshelf. So the picture on the right, remember the bookshelf, because when you see the after photos, your, your eyes are, you, you're, it's going to be tough to, for this, the process. It's so different. But this is the, on the photo on the left, that's looking back at the front door. The kitchen's on the left here. Look at that kitchen. Imagine cooking breakfast in that thing every morning. <laughs> Heck no, right? We want to tear all that out and make it beautiful. That's exactly what we did. So, so hiring contractors, you want to create your own scope of work for the bids. So whenever we bid, 
even contractors that we've been doing business with, we still write everything out that we want them to do and we hand it to them. We hand them a list of every single item that we want them to tear out and replace. And there's costs associated with all that. You got your demo work. We negotiate one price to demo the whole house. Any debris that we needed carried off, that's, that's included in their labor. We negotiate their labor prices on installing items. We'll provide the the um, we'll provide the uh, the materials, not on everything, but but most of it. So we have those line items of labor to install drywall, labor to and you know tape bed texture, paint, all these different line items. So we provide a, a pretty robust scope of work up front, so we, they know exactly what we want. So the more detailed you are the better it'll be because if you don't know what you don't know, contractors will eat you alive. They will take you for a ride and they will suck as much money out of you as possible. So finding great contractors is asking for referrals for competent contractors. Always ask for references. If you get a, con if, especially if you're going to spend north of 30 grand on a job or a client of yours is going to spend a lot of money, you've got to get some references. You want to talk to some other people that have already been through that experience. If they can't provide references, then you need to move on to somebody else because they don't want you to talk to anybody they've done work for. And there's a reason. Having a signed contract and agreement for scope of work is super important, especially when you're going to go into a really big job. Can't stress that enough. There's different ways that you can find contracts. There's there's a bullet point, con, you know, scope of work. You can find these contracts online. They're not, they're not difficult to find. But contractors will take advantage of you if you let them. And, and I always say this, don't give your entire project to one contractor. We learned that the hard way because all they're going to do is they're going to go find someone else that they're going to come give a bid. We call that subcontractors. And that subcontractor contractor comes back, says, yeah, we'll do that for 2,500. And they come back to you said, yeah, that'll be 3,700. So they're putting a spread on everything, which is fine. But if they're not transparent with you, then they are going to take your money. Let me, I can't stress that enough. Having a payment schedule for contractors, we're going to pay you X amount up front to start the job. And then we're going to make three more additional distributions. It just depends on the scope of work, right? If you're doing a ground up construction, there's, you know, hundreds of line items that have to be addressed. So the schedule is a little different with single family houses. Any contractor that's successful should be able to float some capital up front, meaning that they should have a line of credit or their own cash to start buying materials. Anybody that says, oh, we need half or three quarters of the money up front. That's a red flag. How much materials do they need to get started? Whatever the case may be. So having a payment schedule up front is very important. And you always hold the final payment until the punch list is complete. Punch list is all the little stuff, all the tiny little things, the nicks, the, the cracks, the crevices, the, the caulking, the boards, anything that needs to be buttoned up and addressed. And I would always recommend you guys getting an inspection before you put it on the market, right? And everyone you talk to is going to have a different opinion about that. Real estate's about disclosure. So why not disclose everything you know up front? Here it is. We've already done the inspection. We had these nine items that we needed to address. Here's all the invoices for the electrical, the plumbing and all that. Great guys, here we go. Let us know if there's anything else you need. So taking that initiative, right? It's Because I'm sure you guys have been in deals where inspection come back, comes back and it scares the shit out of the buyer and they're out. Anybody had that happen? I, I've had that happen so plumbing is the typical big surprise. It's always the number one deal killer. I've had several thousand. I've had deals where there was $15,000, $18,000 worth of plumbing that needed to get done before the house sold. I've personally had houses that we've left foundations on that we missed cracks in the cast iron, get it in escrow, had to turn around and give a $10,000 concession. That's giving our money back, you know, to get the deal closed. So don't overlook plumbing. Just know that there's going to be plumbing surprises. And it's typically under slab, under foundation, going the gas line going from the meter, the, the meter base to the house, inside the house, either from the front of the house in, right? You got water lines coming in, you got sewage going out. So plumbing's your number one surprise. So don't overlook the plumbing, get those lines tested, pressure test them, water test them, hydrostatic test them. Um, but also not budgeting surprises, I think is a, is a big, I wouldn't say kiss of death, but it's a big one. So just know you're going to go over. All projects go over budget and the carrying costs will eat you alive. You know, you want to try to get these projects done within three to three to four months, reno time. Obviously, if you're building, if you have a massive project, then that's going to take a lot longer. But the interest expenses, the taxes will eat you alive. The carrying costs could be anything related to it, your utilities, your interest payments, insurance. 
So don't overlook that your interest is a big expense, especially if, if you have some type of capital. I like to do accruing payments. I have a personal relationship with my lender. So we buy the property. I'm not making them payments, right? We're in the deal together. We've joint ventured. But if you're going to pay someone an interest rate over time to borrow capital, just know that every month that money's going out the door along with all your other expenses and then change orders. That's something that don't get too creative in the middle of the deal because that can blow your deal as well. You know, getting too creative, like, oh, well, we need to change the plan to this. Well, there's additional costs in there and the contractors love it because they get to make more money off of you. So here are the initial repair numbers on the Celta Voli house. We budgeted for about 75,000. We went over budget. We made some, what I call game time decisions. This was a really small house and we knew the market well. That's another thing is understanding exactly who your target buyer is or knowing the type of demographic of people that are living in a certain area, your finishes, your marketing, everything is tailored around providing and positioning this property to your ideal client, the, the family that's going to buy this. We knew that a first time home buyer, younger couple was going to buy this house, right? I've lived in apartments, condos, some of my friends, and nowadays those apartments and condos are smoking. You know, they got quartz countertops and all kinds of beautiful finishes on the inside. So we knew that this would, would be that type of buyer. And, and in this particular property, it was built in 45. So everything had to be redone. We took it down to the studs and we had tons of surprises, multiple, multiple surprises. So 1230, I love this. I'm blazing through this. Um, Hey, Ian. Yeah. We have a question from Chris. Does carrying include the listing time during longer days on market? It does. It's all included. From the day you buy it, you're bleeding to the day you sell it. So it's the same thing with builders, right? They want these damn houses off the books and they're willing to give huge chunks of cash to, to close it now versus carry it for another four to six months. So the big bonuses that they're paying today, they know that if they have to hold this house, especially going into Q1 next year. So right now to the end of the year, you guys should be shaking the trees and standing on the top of the world and blasting builders incentives and new construction right now, because there's going to be a rush of people trying to get these incentives towards the end of the year. But anyway, yes, you are carrying from the day you purchase to the day you close, right? It's just like the pass through of taxes. You get a proration from the day you close and when you bought it. And then the same thing when you sell it, you're handing it back over to them. But you, the investor, are on the hook for all the expenses. So that's the challenge is not blowing the budget because if you have a limited amount of capital, you've got to be very cautious. <clears throat> so this property, we listed way over market. And the reason we did, because we knew it was a gym and we knew it was in an amazing area, regentified, Bishop Arts, everything is changing down there. The city's putting money into the uh, infrastructure. Businesses are there, high rises are going up, all the, the really cool combinations of mixed use commercial now that we're seeing in all of our big cities go up. That was right down the street. So we knew we had a gym and then West Kessler was right next to it. There was a property that comped for like 275 a foot, very similar. And then South, there was another property that comped for 265 a foot, but this particular neighborhood, everything was comping for you know, 200 to 220 a foot. So the real value of this house is around 225, but we said, hell with it. The market was hot. We knew we had something great. So we positioned it and threw it up on the market really high just because we knew there was so much demand. So when I say be different, I always use pro photos. Like I'm sure you guys have seen the photos. You're like, oh my gosh, how could this agent put this property on the market? Just sp spend a hundred bucks. It's it's not expensive to have professional photos done. The photos are so important. It's the very first thing a consumer sees and even the agent sees. And when agents see beautiful homes, they're going to sell those houses. When, they're, when they get their clients to that front door, they're going to they're gonna convince them why they should buy that house versus the five other that they just saw. So you're not only positioning it for consumers, you're positioning it for the brokers and agents too. Just like you guys have seen, right? If you see something that's really great that you know your client wants, it's like, man, guys, this is it, right? We haven't seen anything like this. So the description, here's something that I just laugh when I see descriptions. So, so take a step back and think about a $5 million house. On a $5 million listing, right? When they're putting a description out, what are they going to describe this property? Oh, it's got stainless steel appliances and stained glass in the kitchen, right? The, house, the property is so much bigger, right? You have to think about 
you're selling the amenities, you're selling the lifestyle, you're selling what it's like to live in that house, where it's next to what the things that you capture, the things that you get that's different from somewhere else. So this is something that I've learned over time. Um, I kind of cut my teeth by copying multi-million dollar listings because most of those agents hire writers to write their descriptions. Now we have AI and we have all these different tools. But if you look at this description, we have everything on a document that we did to the house it's attached in the MLS, right? So I'm not going to put all those things, new windows, new roof, new this, new that, new this, new that, new this. That's not telling me anything about the house. Yeah, shit's all new, but really. So be thinking about the way that you describe property. You're selling the lifestyle of what it's like to live in that house, what it's close to, what amenities does it have, right? Is it right next to the, the football stadium or is it right next to an airport? What are the amenities? What's the location? What's it like to live in that area? So that's how we write our descriptions. So if you guys want to screenshot that, snap it up. The next time you're writing a description, have some AI help you or go into your market and pull a $20 million listing and just like look at the way that everything was written in the flow of words. So that's a huge pro tip right there. So, I mean, look at this house. This is what we did to this thing. It actually came out amazing. 82,000 acquisition. We spent about 90 in repairs, right? We gutted this house down to the studs and rebuilt the entire thing. That cedar porch was an, was an afterthought. It was a game time decision, cost another $2,200 to have that done. But we saw it on another house in another neighborhood and it looked amazing. So we got lucky with this house. Um, we sold it for 250 and I, there's a whole, I have stories about three appraisals and the lending and the, and the buyer agent. It was just a whole racket, but we got the deal closed. But you can see here, we manicured the houses from front to back, side to side. We go through every inch of the entire house from beginning to end. Here's those two photos again. Remember that from the front door, looking at the, uh, the shelving. So we did a cathedral ceiling. We took the, the ceiling up to the roof line in the living room put an LD, LVL through the kitchen area, resupported the, the weight of the house and then opened up the kitchen and then even swung the, the, the gas range around. And that's a benefit that you have with pier and beam homes is it's really easy to reconfigure and restructure because you can just go right underneath the house with the plumbing and the electrical. But these were the original hardwoods too. So we pay about $6 a foot to have this done. That would be almost the cost of putting down new engineered wood, but this is another feature of the home. This, these are the original floors. They've just been, hand, they've been sanded, hand scraped and restained and sealed. <clears throat> Here's the kitchen. So this is a, you know, $250,000 house. I think it's sold on the MLS for over 350 now. So it's, it's changed hands a couple of times. So there's the kitchen. We took a lot of brick out and we found a lot of brick in the back. So we were able to move that window around, raise it up, put the sink right there, swung it around. There was a utility closet on the left. We expanded the uh, the bathroom into the closet, which I'll show you here in a second. So here are a couple more angles. So we typically spray the walls and the ceilings the same color. Uh, it's just a, a time-saving thing. A lot of builders do that now. If people want, like you can see here on the right picture on the right, we did paint that wall in the dining area a little darker for an accent. So we will go through the expense on some items, but some things you really just need to kind of cruise through, right? Like I don't need to pay my crew to go off and tape off the entire house to paint the trim two shades darker, which I would love to do that. But, you know, you also have to think about the level of home that you're refinishing and then the price point and the buyer. So as you go up higher in price, all those little custom touches make a big difference. So we love doing a kind of an enhanced hardware package, higher end lighting LEDs, put LEDs under the countertops, put plugs. We try to make it as efficient as possible. Here's the bathroom. That tub used to be underneath the, the window. So we got lucky there was a closet on the out back side of that. So that tub where it sits now is actually sitting in the closet of the other room. We just happened to have enough room to expand. This is a one bathroom house. So we made the bathroom wider. A lot of these uh, products like our countertops, we, we try to buy these single swipe, meaning as a, as a combo, either through a local builder supply store. This one came from house.com, H-O-U-Z-Z. If you guys aren't looking at that site, it's amazing because you can see finishes and fixtures and there'll be little tags on it. You can click on it. It'll take you right to the site and it'll show you what the price is and you can have it ordered and delivered. So looking at real estate through a design designer lens is what everything that we've talked about today 
when you're approaching real estate with consumers, sellers, buyers, positioning listings for market, how can you make the listing look better, right? Staining the fence, power washing the house, cleaning up the yard, right? All those different things that will make the property look better. So this is kind of twofold for you guys. Yes, it's for in investing, but at the end of the day, we're all in real estate. So sharpening your skills on what this stuff costs, it will position you to win more listings and close more buyer deals. So the backyard here, there's a detached garage. We couldn't figure out why everything was wet until it rained. Well, then there was a big monsoon of water that came off of the other property and came inside this garage. Everything was on pallets. So that was another game time decision we made. We had to do French drains around this garage to push the water out and back into the alley. And then we put drains on the back of the house and then we did uh, stone pavers here. You see those pots on the left. So we made a patio there. We extended it out. And the next time it rained, there wasn't any sitting water in the garage nor on the back of the house here. So there you go, guys. I usually take a, take a lot a lot more time to go through this, but I wanted to blast through this information just so we all could kind of have a conversation. I could wrap up and have any, uh, you know, answer any convert, answer any questions you guys have. Cindy, I don't employ my own crews. I think that if you want to get into the renovation game and be a contractor, yeah, you would have to. That was one of the challenges that we got squeezed with years ago was trying to do houses in volume and not employing our own crews. Because if, when you're hiring other crews, they're kind of bouncing in and out in, on and off your deals. I had lunch yesterday with a, a good friend of mine who's and mentor. We've been in business together. He's renovated, gosh, well over a thousand houses. And he was telling me that he had to go fire one of his general contractors. He's like, I knew I should have done it on month three, but at month six, it was, it was time. I had to go fire him. That was hard to do. <clears throat> you got it, Gloria. Questions, comments. Working with investors right now, the investor game is heating up um, a little bit of my personal real estate businesses. We represent a hedge fund. Um, I've written nine contracts just this week. Today's Wednesday morning. Investors are buying crazy right now. So over time, building relationships with more investors is a, definitely something you guys want to focus on. Finding big, you know, the iBuyers, open door offer pad. I know, gosh, open door I saw just had like almost like a billion dollar loss. But if they're still buying, you guys can put properties in front of them. So that's the name of the game, right? Finding different ways, networking with different brokers, investors companies that can position you to help buy and sell at a higher level. Jaime, feedback. You've, you've heard this presentation before. Anything that I missed that you think that I should cover before we get out of here? No, I think one of the more interest, you kind of, you introduced it at the beginning, but finding the opportunities, that's something that is going to always, you know, there's always going to be, we, we can never speak on that enough. Yeah. So you, you covered a few strategies. So right now, what are you, what's your, cause you work with hedge funds, you work with investors, you are an investor and all that stuff. So right now as we're getting into 2023, where would you focus on if I, you're strategically looking at getting these opportunities or getting in front of these opportunities? Distressed sellers, people that have to sell, not want to sell, right? People that need to sell. So there's different list brokers that you guys can pull in your local area. Um, they're all over the web. There's a lot of different ones and they're all scraping pretty much the same data. So here's the, here's a, a I wouldn't say a challenge, but here's doing this at a high level, even for just a real estate brokerage, right? Because you can go into the, it, it doesn't matter if you can buy it or not. If you can list it, then you can position it for investors, build relationships with investors. But the public records, bankruptcies, divorces, probates, pre-foreclosures, those are hot lists right there. And that's a nonstop list of inventory that's that's hitting the, the court records. So there are different companies that provide that data to you. You can buy a list of, I believe, about 800 records. I just pulled one very recently for um, a broker in New Jersey we're, we're doing business with. And there was 832 records in his county that fit, you know, one of those five different lists because the public records, everything, when an when attorney files a Liz pendants or notice of trustee sale, 
in the county courthouse, they basically take that document and they image it. Sometimes at least you even put it in a spreadsheet and put all the data in there. But there are companies that scrape data from public record websites and, and sell that data to us as, you know, B2B type of deal. And then it's us, B2C, to take that data and skip trace it and scrub it. So let's say we took that eight, those 800 records and I'm going to go hire another company, TLO, or another skip tracing service and go, I want you guys to scrub down this list. And we're going to scrub down that list and start providing additional addresses, phone numbers, emails. Then we're going to take all that data and then we're going to start marketing to them. Text messages, blast messages. Hey, saw you had a house. You, you may or may not do the, you know, the auto input, but you could message them. Saw you had a house in whatever county are you looking to sell it? Having a ISA or a, 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 a team that calls, right? Because you're not going to call every single day, day after day after day to tee up appointments. So making those outbound calls, you can actually postcard we call it a check letter, which is another letter that's like, you know, offering someone like if you're trying to buy, right? Hey, I'm looking to purchase your house. So that's another thing, the messaging, if you're messaging people that are in pre-foreclosure, then your messaging needs to be something about stopping your house from foreclosure, you know, saving your credit. If it's a bankruptcy, right? Your marketing message is a little different. So, but if you're doing a blast, it's like, Hey, I saw that you had a house in this, in this County. Are you open to selling it? Or do you need any you know resources to help you get this property ready? So the marketing aspect is going to be the toughest. But once you have some things in place that you can continue to plug leads into, basically take the data, plug it into your marketing machine, right? Text, phone calls, emails, door knocking, flyers, whatever the case may be, and then have that team setting appointments for you to get on the phone or face to face with folks, either to try to list the house or try to buy the house. So that's a model for distressed real estate that will never go old. So all this paying for referrals and paying for funnels and paying for all this stuff that all these companies are marketing to us. I'm guilty of it. I've bought, I can't tell you how many products I've bought over the years. I've learned so much from them, but distressed real estate is something that's, it's always going to be around. It should be a part of your real estate, I guess, journey, because we all got in real estate to live abundantly, not to you know, have a nine to five job. At least I believe that's why most people get into real estate. Correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but distressed real estate is a way that you can position yourself right now today to help people. Like that picture I showed you of, with Lynn, like, Lynn, what are your challenges? She's like, well, my mom's broke. I can't afford to move across country. We're really struggling with what to do. Okay, great. Here's an estate company. Here's an estate sale company. How about you guys go get everything out of the house that you want or at put, you know, or put stickers on everything. We'll move everything in the garage. How about I pay for your, your moving truck and I'll hire some guys to come over to help pack everything. She's like, you got, you would do that for us. I mean, what's a couple thousand bucks in when we're going to make 70 or 80 or a hundred. So being that source, being that resource of helping people, obviously getting in front of distressed leads is important, but when you do get that person on the phone, it's, it's human to human. Hey, how can I help you? How can I solve your challenge? That's how you win business. Not, Hey, I'm the best agent in the world. We sell our houses for 18% more and 25% less time. You ready to list your house with me today? What? Click. You know, my mom's about to die. I don't, heck, heck with you. You get my point, right? So that's just real estate one-on-one helping people. But as this market shifts and changes, distressed real estate becomes a lot more, there's going to be a lot more eyeballs on it because that's the direction people are going. Because when the markets are hot, right? You just throw a sign in the yard, houses sell. But now that the market shifted, it's correcting interest rates. The retail buyers are getting squeezed out. So the institutional, the mom and pa's, the investors, those are the people that are emerging in, not necessarily emerging in. Like my investors were quadrupling down on the amount of offers that we're making. So I can talk, I can rattle on on this topic all day. It's my favorite topic in the world is real estate. So I hope you guys got some value out of this. If you have any questions, let me know, man. All right. So for questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute yourselves if you feel comfortable. Either's going to work. All right. All righty. Jaime, um, you were about to buy another house, right? Uh, yeah. You decide on that? You going to move forward with that? I, I remember like cash, but I'm going to have to. Yeah. yeah, I remember uh, remember four months ago, you're like, yeah, I'm not paying $35,000 more to buy. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, four to six months ago, 
market was a lot different than it is now. Right. So opportunities to purchase like a few of the offers that we got back. So we're on a, on a weekly basis. We're probably juggling a dozen to two dozen properties that were either going to be making an offer or we're getting underwritten by our client. And like I had three come back this morning, which two of them were 50,000 under asking. And another one was a hundred thousand under asking. I'm not going to write those and send those, but what I am going to do is I'm going to monitor them because we just locked up. A, we're actually about to lock up a contract now, but the last one that I closed, we were $45,000 off and I just waited for it. And I just waited and waited and waited. I followed up. I followed up. I followed up. I stayed in contact. And then as they didn't get their price, our offer became a lot more attractive. And then I put it in front of them because we make, we make offers on coming soon houses too. So, you know, identifying your clients, identifying what investors want, identifying what buyers and builders and asset managers and all these other companies, what they want, and then having a handful of companies, investors that you can bring them deals. That's essentially a part of what our business is, is feeding them what they want. And now that the market has shifted, right, that activity has increased. So thanks, guys. We'll see you on social. You'll see us on our calls. Jaime, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone that is attended today. If you have any questions, you guys know how to reach out to me. Hit me up. Let's talk. Let's move forward. Let's uh, have an amazing year in real estate. And the next year, let's have an even more amazing year. <laughs>